Let's make it easy for you. Go to 1 Corinthians 13. That's where we're going to end up tonight. We have been talking about the fruits of the Spirit and going through, and uh, it, our key verse is Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 23, and it says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then it lists a bunch of things, and we worked on those last week that were uh, works of the flesh and uh, things that went. But then now we're looking at the fruits of the Spirit tonight. And it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And so we've been setting the basis for what walking the Spirit is. We said that the fruits of the Spirit are what? Okay, this is week three. Let's see if you can get it right. Results of what you do. Fruits of the Spirit are results. Uh, I've been dying to tell a story forever. I tell it too much because I like it so much, but tonight I'm going to tell it. I just decided today that I was going to throw it in. But, you know, I have a fruit story. When I was uh, moved to Florida right after I first started the ministry, I went to Georgia for a year and then went to Florida for a year. And we moved into this house that uh, in Florida, and it had a fruit tree in the backyard. And I went back there, and they, when we moved in, they, it was just starting, and they were coming. And uh, I said to my wife, I said, this is awesome. We have an orange tree. I was so excited that we had an orange tree in the backyard. I was ready to be a true Floridian and drink fresh squeezed orange juice every morning. And I went out and I bought two juicers for or that make orange juice. And I was telling everybody, I'm going to have fresh squeezed orange juice and it's going to be amazing. And I had all these things started researching on how to do it and get the best juice and you know, that, and I started watching my orange tree grow in the backyard. And I will tell you, they were big, and they were beautiful, and they were growing, and they were growing. And one day, as it was getting near the time, um, my neighbor came over, and he said, how's your lemon tree doing? And I looked at him, and I said, what do you mean? I said, I have an orange tree. He said, no, you don't. You have a lemon tree. I said, but lemons, they're, they're small and they're oblong. He said, yeah. He said, but there's commercial lemons. And he said, they just grow those big and fat like a grapefruit. And he said, that's what you got in your backyard. I said, no, look at them. They're the prettiest oranges you ever saw. He said, I'm telling you, that's a lemon tree. Now, we have to understand that in our life, our fruit shows what we are. Our fruit shows who's in control. We studied last week the works of the flesh, and the, when those things came out, then that means what? It means we're in trouble. It means who's in control? Ourself, our flesh. And when we looking at these fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, and peace, when that comes out, generally who's in control with that? The Holy Spirit. And so we have to understand that. Well, with this tree, I was positive it sure did look like an orange. It smelled like an orange. And I had, was excited and I decided not to listen to my neighbor. And I was ready to go and I kept going out there and squeezing them. And finally, uh, one felt just right. And I, I knew it was it. I picked it. I took it in. I sliced it. I put it into the juicer. And I had the sourest, nastiest, strongest lemon, lemon juice you could see or taste. Now on the outside, what you saw was a beautiful orange, but it came from a tree that was a lemon tree. And no matter how much I wanted those to be oranges, that was a lemon tree, so it was going to produce what? Lemon. If your flesh is in control, no matter how much you want it to produce, love, joy, peace, and all these good things, it's going to produce the works of the flesh, unfortunately for you. Because whatever you're grounded in and whatever is in control, that's what's going to happen. Now, here's the good news. How many are saved in here? 
Guess what you have the ability to be? An orange tree. You have the ability to walk in the Spirit. And you have the ability to have the fruits of the Spirit. You know, the unsaved man on the corner, he can only fake it. He can't walk in the Spirit. So he's therefore always going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. So we need to, in our life, decide, I'm going to look at the fruits and see what's represented. Last week, how did you do, uh, how many of you watched how you were doing and let it rec- allowed yourself to recognize who was in control? How many did that last week? Okay. How many, it wasn't pretty. <laughs> And you have to kick yourself back in. You have to bring it into obedience. So we're going to look at now the first one, love. You need to take and understand truly what love is so that you can properly see if I am doing right. Am I walking in the spirit? Am I producing what I'm supposed to do? So we're going to look at that tonight. I don't think I've prayed, so let's pray and get rolling. Lord, we sure do love you. Thank you for the work that you're doing in our lives. Lord, I'm just so excited to be here, and I can't wait till next week when we can be back together. Lord, I pray that you continue to keep people safe and help us as we're in your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So, first fruit of the Spirit is love. The RU definition, which I like very much, is love is the willing, sacrificial giving of oneself for the benefit of others without the thought of return. We often mistake love as something that is reciprocal. We believe that love should be something that I give and something comes back and I receive and then I give back. But love is a singular direction. I was counseling somebody this week and I was trying to convince them of this concept and we weren't getting there at all. Because they were only looking at what they received. They said, well, that's not love. I said, love is what you determine it to be. See, love is me giving to others. Love is me investing in others. I don't look at what I get because I've already been loved. Who have I been loved by? God. The greatest gift in the world. And that's all I need. So we see this love that is evident in Scripture, the Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ died for you. He shed His blood on the cross for you. And He gave the ultimate gift for you. And all you have to do is realize you're a sinner. Realize you can't get yourself to heaven. Realize that you need Jesus Christ to save you. And then ask him to come into your heart and save you. That's the greatest gift in the world. Isn't that amazing what Christ did for us? That sacrifice. And you know what? There was nothing coming to him in return. He didn't have to die. But he chose to do that. Why? Out of love. So that he could give himself for us. We need to take and recognize what true love is. That there is no reciprocal. So then, number three, if we do not yield to God's leading to demonstrate love towards others, they will not be convinced that we are believers in and followers of Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible says in John 13, verses 34 and 35, A new commandment I give unto thee, unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. First thing I want you to notice about that is, is he said, you got to love as I loved. What did Christ do in order to love? We just said it. He died. He died for you. He shed his blood on the cross For every single one of you. And we take in our mind frame and we think, Oh, uh, I just got to worry about myself and I got to take care of myself. Or we say, man, I can't forgive that person. I can't love that person because they did this or that. But Jesus Christ knew every sin that you have committed and that you were going to commit when he died on the cross. 
And he still did it for you, despite you. How many times do you fail to love somebody else because it's conditional? It's based on somebody else's disposition. It's based on somebody else's actions. We have to learn this unconditional love that God has. And that's when it becomes the fruit of the Spirit. When we're allowing Christ to rule through us, it becomes God's love that's unconditional. And other people can see, then the second part of this, is that you are one of his disciples. They can see the Holy Spirit in you because they can see something else in control besides you. Because when you're in control, it's not pretty. When I'm in control, it's not pretty. Uh, I've made some really big mistakes and I've been a really mean person when I am in control. But I can be a nice person only when the Holy Spirit's in control. And then people see, wow, God's really at work. It was not too long ago that there was a situation and it was a pretty tense situation. Somebody uh, uh, really attacked at me and I just took a step back and I happened to, to really be in the right place. I, I, I tried to walk in the spirit as good as I could, step back, listened and handled myself in that way. And I, I didn't realize I, as I walked away, there was a person there and they said, Pastor Scott said, I saw what your reaction was. I said, you did? They said, yes, I saw right off the bat when that was coming at you. They said, everything inside of you just wanted to lunge. And then they said, I saw something else overtake you. And I saw you get really calm and peaceful. Now, I wish that would happen always. Okay, I'm not bragging on myself and saying, oh, I'm always allow the Holy Spirit to be peaceful. But it was neat to me that somebody could see real quick a flash of my flesh and they could all of a sudden see that something else took over and allow the Holy Spirit to come in and be in control. That's what's got to happen in your life. If you take and allow the Holy Spirit to rule you, to be in control, then when you face a situation, instead of anger and wrath and everything else, love will come out. And then people will know, that's Christ. That's God in them. They're different because <laughs> they, they met Christ. There's something way different about them. Do people say you're different? At work, do they see that you're different? Do they see that there's something different about you? So, let's go to our passage that I asked you to turn to. 1 Corinthians 13 gives us a good pattern of what love is. It's important for you to understand what love is so that you can see when you're not practicing it, it means who's in control. So, flesh. And when you are practicing it, it generally means who's in control? The Holy Spirit. So, in 1 Corinthians 13, the Bible says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my gifts, get goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Let's stop there. But as we look here, it gives us a pattern of what true love is. The first thing I want you to see as we dissect and break it down, it says, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity suffereth long and is kind. How is your patience? How is your patience? 
during this little COVID-19 time, how has your patience been? How many of y'all have been for a longer time than normal, been locked up with other people a little more than usual? Yeah. All right. How many it's gotten to you? Okay. How many of you are ready to escape? Ready to break out. Let's get out of here. <laughs> People are driving me up a wall. I was talking to somebody who worked at 911 the other day. And a pastor had asked him, how are you doing? Uh, how are things going? He said, well, the first month, he said it was almost like a ghost town. He said, everybody was afraid to go anywhere, do anything. And nobody even wanted to go to the hospital. And it was quiet. He said, it's the slowest I've ever seen 911. He said, and then everybody started getting irritated with each other. He said, domestic violences are going crazy right now. Do you hear about the one, there was a couple and they were driving down. It was actually near my house. It was near State Street. They were driving down th through there and they got in a fight and they ended up hitting a telephone pole and the guy ended up stabbing the woman, I believe, and something like that. It was crazy. You know why? Because... <laughs> They don't suffer long and they're not kind. Why do we have all this problem? People are tested when they're put with each other. Why do you not suffer long? Why are you not kind? Why are you not patient with others? Why? Because who are you concerned about? Self. See, if God's in control and the Holy Spirit is leading you, you're going to be patient. You're going to, I love the word forbearance in Colossians chapter 3. It literally means to put up with. You are going to take and sit back and put up with all these battles coming at you. And you're going to put up with people who irritate you. And you're going to put up with uh, a conflict. You're going to sit back and say, you know what? God loved me. I have no expectations. I can love everybody because I accept whatever they give me today. But we don't suffer long. And when we're not patient and we're not suffering long to others, we're not very kind. We have this mind frame that we're not going to put up with any inconveniences. Don't you dare take and shift anything around. I am going to be in control and you're going to treat me a certain way. We have to take and change that mind frame. Second thing we see here is it love envieth not. You know what? Love lifts up others, not self. Envy takes and it's looking at everybody else and it's generating and thinking, what am I supposed to get and what am I supposed to have? The opposite of envy is looking and saying, what do they need? What do I have to get? I love the, when I see the uh, little boy with the five loaves and two fishes. Can you imagine what that would be like? Your mama packs you a lunch and some guy walks up and asks for your lunch. Well, it's mine. I, I wish my kids were always in the mind frame to give everything they have. But when they were young, they fought that. But there was a time not too long ago um, where... My children, they were all going through different struggles. I had two at college, or had two at college before all this hit, and one teaching school in Tennessee. And they all hit disappointments, and they all hit battles. And my wife came to me one day and said, look at what happened. Said, Kaylin hit this battle, and it was either Austin or Jordan took and sent her money uh, to go get a uh, coffee over here and then said then austin hit this battle and like kaylin sent him a gift card to some place and then jordan sent a gift card and they were all in the same week had seen a need of one of the other siblings and they reached out and gave a gift you know what we tend to do in conflict you know what we tend to do in conflict bend down the hatches i gotta protect myself you know, what we have to do is stop envying. Stop looking at what, what should you get. i got a question for you. 
When you see somebody else get something, what's your response? You know, what's your response if I take here and I do this tonight? I, I, I walk, look around, and I look here. Let's see here. Hmm. Oh, it's funny to look at the, my guys here right now. If you could see their eyes. They're all looking at me without raising their hands, saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. But they, you, know, you know who wasn't doing it? it it's somebody way over here. Don't bring the camera over here, but we're going to go all the way over here. Yes. Okay. And do you know what the natural response when somebody else gets $10 and we don't? Yeah, where's mine? Why didn't I get it? Why didn't he pick me? Why does he like them better than me? All right. You know what your response should be? Praise the Lord. I, I had a friend who had a, uh, quite a bit of money, and he would never share his blessings. Because he said, every time I share a blessing, everybody would all the time say, well, I wish I had that. Well, why did God bless that you and they didn't bless me? You already have a lot. Why doesn't God consider me? And he said, I can never be happy about my blessings because everybody complains that I get blessings. Isn't that a sad statement? You know what the problem is? Is we're not loving when we do that. But I want you to think about it. How often is your response, what about me? How often is your response envy rather than the sacrificial giving of oneself without the thought of return? The next thing is vaunteth not itself. Steve Currington wrote it here is not stuck up. I'm going to say doesn't put yourself ahead of everybody else. Unfortunately, most of the time we prefer ourselves over everything. It's our human nature. It's that self-preservation inside of us. Let me tell you one of the biggest things that stands in front of love. It's self-preservation. Okay? Now, on its face value, is self-preservation rebellion, wicked, wrong? No. What is self-preservation? Trying to protect yourself. Trying to take care of yourself. How many often you have a, that hits you to where your body just is trying to preserve itself because of maybe you being taken advantage of or going through a hard time or, or abused in the past? How many of you, your body naturally goes to self-preservation? A bunch of you. And immediately when you do, you think in your mind it's okay because I have to preserve, I have to protect. But I have a question for you. When that happens, are you vaunting yourself? Are you putting yourself ahead of everything else? Yes. So therefore, is self-preservation a biblical principle? No. It's geared and driven by what? The flesh. It's not the Holy Spirit in control. You say, how am I supposed to protect myself? Hmm. Anybody got any ideas? the Lord. See, I have to take and sit back and walk in the Spirit. And when I face something that I am afraid of, at what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. So when you face a situation, instead of going into self-preservation, what are you going to do? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. You're going to come back and say, I'm going to trust the Lord Therefore, you don't vaunt yourself. You sit still and allow God to take care of your problem. We have to come to a point where we can say, if I'm going to practice true love, that means that I gets out of it. It means that I get set to the side and I just want to love. It's interesting. We'll finish this up next week. But I will finish with this. The Bible says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, thy mind. And then it goes on to say, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then it says, all the law, 
all the commandments, everything hangs on those. That's pretty powerful. If you can come to the point that in your mind frame, you recognize that that's the kind of love I have to have all the time, that I'm not putting myself forward, that I am not envying others, that I am patient and I'm suffering others and I sit back and I'm having that attitude with people, you'll be amazed at how it'll show you when the Holy Spirit's not in control. Because every time you lunge to self-preserve, every time you lunge to put yourself first, every time you try to make something happen, you're going to recognize that wasn't love. And I have to be still and let my God work. And when you let God do that, great things happen. So tonight, let's start looking at this love factor. Let's start looking to see if we're letting God be in absolute control. Lord, we sure do need you. Lord, so often we try to control everything around us. We try to push everything around us. Rather than allowing your Holy Spirit control, Lord, I pray that tonight we will humble our mind frame. We'll humble our spirit. We'll walk in you. We'll recognize where we allow something else to be in control. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, we've been asking this question for this is now the third week. Who's in control? Could say, as you talked about, the, this is those first three parts of what love is. I recognize where I thought maybe I was in love, but I was walking in my flesh rather than walking in the spirit. And God revealed truth to me tonight. Pray for me, would you? Amen. Praise God. How about you at home? How about you? Are you letting the love of Christ control you? Are you walking in the spirit or are you in control? Tonight, let's ask God to help us change it. Let's allow that to show us when we're walking in the spirit and when we're walking in the flesh. And if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you can tonight. You can realize you're a sinner, realize you need Jesus Christ, that he loved you so much that he died for you. And all you have to do is humble yourself before him, repent of your self-reliance, and ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and save you tonight. Lord, we sure do need you in a great way. Lord, I pray that we take this truth of love, recognize when we're not practicing it, and recognize the reason we're not practicing it is because we are in control rather than the Holy Spirit. Guide and direct our steps now in Jesus' name. Amen.